yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and of course for the invitation. Um, has been a lovely conference, uh, quite widespread. So it's really living up to its, to its title, but goes way beyond. And um, today's talk is kind of at the border of the interest of the conference, which gives me the great pleasure to be extremely basic and to stay on quite some completely combinatorial level. So if you have some questions, it's just my fault and you should just interrupt me and ask the questions. So um, this, whole, this whole story is actually a big failure somehow. Uh, so I'm thinking about this problem of kind of finding a small strip, kind of having some good grip on gross rates of representations uh, of monoids in a certain way. And I'm doing this for 30 years. And um, so something like four months ago, Kevin and Victor, so Victor Ostek and one of my bosses here, Kevin came around and just generalized everything from SL2. So I'm just going to show you SL2 today to some ridiculous generality. Um, so I, I needed 30 years to go to SL2. Uh, and we're only staying with SL2 today, and they can do something like any affine semi group super scheme, something in that gender. Anyway, SL2 is good enough for me today. Um, so all of this is joint work with Mike and, and Matreya. So the well, probably they have done all the work anyway. So. And what I would like to explain is, uh, well, I don't need to explain it, you can already see it, the picture on the first slide, but what does it have to do with some representation theory? Okay, so I'm going to talk about representation theory of monoids uh, very much in the spirit of Ben Steinberg, so the one that was mentioned on, I think, Tuesday. Um, so it's a really lovely book on representation of monoids, and the way I got into this is just I, I opened the book and it's really lovely and very readable. And it turns out that while well, group representation theory, I probably don't need to convince you that groups are amazing, and group representations are amazing, and people started doing this something like 120 years ago, and it was really successful, and then somehow nobody really did the monoid case, and essentially all the questions that you as I'm well known for groups that are kind of widely open for monoids for some reason that I don't really understand because it's, it's really not much worse than group representation theory, actually. Okay, and I will be very explicit during the talk. So every group talk starts with a slide that has absolutely nothing to do with the rest of the talk. I just wanted to put this up in order to motivate you a little bit and how do, did I actually enter this field? So I, I'm not an expert on monoids in any way. As I said, uh, I learned that I just opened the book by, by Ben Steinberg. And the way I got into this is that there's a kind of a parallel story, which I've been thinking about for 40 years, maybe now. Um, and this is kind of runs in parallel to what I guess everyone here likes. So the tensor categories. So if you think of the ECMA book, for example, kind of runs in parallel and tries to do everything that the book does in a slightly different setting. And we call this, I won't go into details, it won't appear after the slide anymore, but he called this this fiat monoidal categories, a certain type of monoidal category. And it turns out this is kind of my picture here, um, kind of fusion categories, you know, semi simple categories, they kind of categorify groups if you want. Uh, I should really stress that categorify is really, really vague, right? So, so fusion categories kind of categorify groups, and this, these funny categories I'm not going to explain that run in parallel to what you all like. Um, they kind of categorify monoids, if you want, in a certain way. And in a certain way, that's such that the representations of those categories, you would study functors from your category to some other category, are kind of in the same flavor as monoid representations. So all of these theorems about monoids kind of have a categorical analog somewhere. And so if you want to really work on this, you should learn about monoids first. But it kind of, for me, it kind of goes backwards. I learned about those categories first. And then I learned about monoids. Uh, now I'm very hooked up with monoids. I really like them a lot. And I hope to convince you today that this is really worthwhile to study uh, monoids. It's kind of a lot of, a lot of fun. So my goal for today here is a certain type uh, of representations that I would like to describe. As I said uh, in, kind of in the beginning, I kind of am really interested in kind of gross rates of representations or dimensions of representations of groups, monoids categories, any type of object, essentially. Um, and I would like to talk about a little bit about, about those, about kind of the minimal representation of a monoid. So if you really want to get hooked up in this theory, which is about, well, 80 years old by now, uh, these are the main names. 
And essentially everything I'm saying goes back to one of them or to the to my view from group theory like Frobenius, uh, Burnside and, and co. So I'm staying really, really basic. Okay, so this is well studied in some sense and has a really beautiful theory. Um, but still, I get this question all the time, so it's totally, totally fair to ask you, why actually do we want to study monoids? Um, maybe I don't need to motivate you in such a conference, but I still try to do it. So obviously I like them, okay? That, that's a very good reason to study monoids already. Um, but there are more. So I, I already mentioned the connection to uh, representation theory. There's a connection to cryptography, which I'm not going to mention too much. Um, but the point kind of for today is that this really nice group representation theory, there are just many more monoids, and they're still nicer than algebra. So it's kind of in between rep general representation theory of groups, general representation theory of algebra, and somewhere in between other monoids, which have a combinatorial field, and they're still much better. So if you think about how much can you say about the general representation theory of a five dimensional algebra, there's actually not so much you can say. Our groups have character theory and all the beautiful stuff attached to them. So groups are really, really fascinating. And monoids kind of sit in between. And maybe some hint for later, and maybe something people like here. So you actually get, from any kind of monoidal tensor category, whatever kind of setup, you always get a nice family of monoids. And they will play, play an important role later. I just take the ends of some generating object in my category and take the ends to the power of it. And I get kind of this family of uh, monoids, and I kind of would like to study them if n is very big. I want, want to study their representations for n very big. This is kind of my intersection here uh, with the title of the conference. So row credits would be here, tensor categories uh, in Sydney, I guess. Um, okay, so let's get started. So there's this little picture that I really like and I stole from uh, Wikipedia. So there are monoids in this picture. So this essentially there's a set with an operation, and you can ask for three things. You can ask for divisibility that goes to the, uh, I guess, southwest. Um, you can ask for associativity that's a green arrow that goes to the uh, whether it's southeast, and there is identity object, and that goes well identity whatever element, and it goes to the south, and the monoid sits. Uh, kind of in the same way as a semi-group, I will come back to the semi-groups in a second. And as you might have already noticed here, um, my little notation for the monoid is S. So I'm really inconsistent. I should talk about semi-groups. We'll come back to semi-groups in a second. And monoids kind of is all this bit, little bit here. And I will call all these monoids. So in the semi-group is just where everything is invertible. And if you would like to group without unit, and if you would like to think about a group without limit, so then we have something like the equation AB equals one, that doesn't make sense. So you just multiply that equation, maybe I take a different color with A from the right, and you just force the condition that this holds for all elements, and what you get is an inverse semi group, and they all have the same type of flavor. Groups are very different. So the step from the green bubble to the, to the group is, is a huge step. Within the green bubble, it's kind of all kind of the same from the flavor. And that's nothing to say about the, uh, what is it, northwest corner, because they kind of don't have any nice representation theory, as far as I'm aware. So I would be happy to learn something about them. But they're non-associative, so they tend to have not very uh, nice representations on matrices, right? That's what I'm talking about. So everything, by the way, in this talk, disclaimer will be finite unless I state otherwise. And I think stating otherwise is about a time in the talk. Um, so essentially, I should talk about semi groups. I just went with monoids because well, maybe the, the conference could have been called monoidal categories in Sydney, and then I could say monoids, monoidal categories. But yeah, so essentially, I should talk about semi groups. You will see why later. But the, the difference is really is really small. So if I think about my universe, my category of monoids, and I think about my category of semi-groups and I can just go from one to the other by forgetting and um, there's an adjoint in the correct order. I don't never know whether it's left or right, but there's some free adjoint that adjoints a unit. So essentially adding a unit is always free in this business, so there's no real difference um, between them and I will stick with the monoids. So here it's really, really kind of unimportant. On this level, in case you care, 
it gets a bit stupid. So if someone knows some really nice literature about what I would call a semi viewpoint category, which is what really shows up here, then I would be very happy to see that uh, because it would be really helpful. But on the non categorical level, it's really not, not big deal. So going with a monoid or going with a semi group is not, a, is not really a, a problem. And my notation for a monoid will be S. So I'm essentially doing already semi groups here. And the whole point is kind of see that in the talk, so in monoid representation theory, you always have the problem that if you have a times b equals c in, in a group, you could just whatever uh, do the inverse of b and you recover a again. But in the monoid, you kind of lose information as you go along. And the whole point of monoid theory is to keep track of the information loss while you're kind of in your monoid and you multiply and you go further away from the group of units in the monoid. I will be more precise uh, later on. Okay, so I should give you some examples. I give you plenty of examples during the talk. Um, uh, some fun examples, some more <laughs> kind of generic examples. Um, so examples of monoid, every group is a monoid, in case you haven't noticed up to this point. Uh, so group theory is included in monoid theory, obviously. Um, but any multiplicative closed set of matrices will do as well. So that's a semi-group, but again, I don't care about the difference. I uh, think we have a look at the picture here. So everyone knows and likes a symmetric group. So my picture here for the symmetric group, uh, left or right side. So left side is one line notation. So one goes to two. So one goes to two, one goes to two, two goes to four, two goes to four, whatever, seven goes to six, seven goes to six, and so on. And you can draw these nice um, kind of permutation type diagrams that everyone certainly has seen at one point in their life. Uh, and there's an analog in the monoid world, it's just int instead of op, right? So instead of automorphisms, you take endomorphism, and it's called a transformation monoid. And it has those type of pictures. So let's see how it works. So here, for example, what you can have is this business here. So 5 goes to 5, 6 goes to 5, 7 goes to 5, 8 goes to 5. And the object I draw is this little type of merging object that just goes all into the vertex 5. So I'm really for bottom to top. And I put those little little um, dots here to remind myself that all of these are not in the image of my map. Right, so what is it? Uh, 4, 7, 8, and 9 do not appear in my one-line notation. So they're not in the image. I put those little reminders uh, to myself. And you get the transformation monoid, which, as you can see, has a symmetric group built in, but then has um, those additional funny merge type vertices. And you can give a generator and relation presentation, which has randomized the moves, like a symmetric group or break moves, whatever you want to call them, and some sliding moves for the merges. Essentially, that's what it is. And uh, that's maybe the main difference, as you can already see, or maybe you can't, but let me just point it out. But everything on the top is invertible. I can just put on another um, corresponding break that will undo what I've done at the top. At the bottom, I can't. So this little funny uh, merge thing, you can't undo that anymore. So you have lost information if you go from bottom to top. The main difference between monoids and uh, Oops. So there are more examples. Um, uh, one of my favorite ones is the cyclic monoid, which is this one here. It essentially does the following. So it, it starts off like a polynomial ring. Let me try here. So it has some unit here, and then it goes a, a squared, a cubed, and so on. Eventually, it just cycles around a to the fifth, a to the sixth, a to the seventh, in some z mod, in this case, three. Fashion. So it has some polynomial part built in, and eventually at the top, it starts cycling around like a cyclic group. And this is a fun example of a monoid. I will come back to that later. So you could see that in the presentation. Um, with some, at, at one point, it just starts cycling, and that's called a cyclic monoid. And we have the other ones already. Uh, so a German S and German T for ought and end, respectively. I'm also much fun about monoids. So what you can do is you can go to the online integer sequence. And the first sequence you find is the number of, mono uh, the number of groups. And that is a fun sequence. 
And it's, it's, it's really ill understood in the sense that the numbers you see are pretty much random. So not much is known about that sequence. And if you plot it, so what I've done here, the first, the orders of the first thousand groups, uh, you need to do a lock plot, otherwise they will just spike at powers of two. So otherwise you wouldn't see anything. But if you take a lock plot, it, it looks like a starry starry night here, um, like, a, like one of those nice paintings with kind of a, a city downstairs and some stairs, uh, uh, stars upstairs. So just shining brightly uh, during the night. So it's very much a random sequence. So I did some other funny things. I'm, I'm not claiming that I'm, I'm very unique here, but if you look at the sequence, for example, um, there's an open question whether all every number is a group number. So it's an open question. And the first number that doesn't, the only number that doesn't appear here as a group number up to a thousand is I think 17 or something. But it, it's very much random how they arrange themselves. Most of them are one. Or two, or, or one or two, and the rest is kind of uh, completely random spread. I was contrasted by monoids. I don't need to explain how the monoids work. Uh, the graph is pretty obvious, I guess. Again, I need to take a lock plot because, as you can see already, is this number just grows in a, in a ridiculously fast fashion. So um, I think, well, the, the number of monoids of order 10 is known. It's whatever that number you see on the screen. It's just a large number. It doesn't, doesn't matter what it is. And it's known that the growth rate is ridiculous, um, but the precise numbers are not known. Um, so it's kind of an open problem. To get them for groups, it's known up to uh, something like 2 to the 9 minus 1. Um, but for monoids, it's only known up to 10, as far as I can tell. So what is this trying to say? This is trying to say that there are just zillions of monoids. You can just see that. And groups are very special types of monoids. They behave very, very strangely in some sense compared to the vastness of monoids. So from this uh, outset, it, it doesn't seem to me to be clear that there is a satisfying theory of monoids. Well, we know the groups, but monoids seem to be kind of, there are so many, there might, might be counterexamples for literally everything you want to write down. But it turns out that there is a very satisfying theory of monoid representations. And a part of point of this graph is that I'm still would like to study kind of monoid representations in the limit. I would really like to do that. And I just have plenty of examples, as you can see. So there are already at two monoids of order two, and we will see them explicitly, something like on the next slide or something. Um, we'll see. It's really, really amazing. So you can let me come back to my starry, starry night. Uh, so groups, pretty much random. And for monoids, I guess you can guess the pattern yourself. OK, fantastic. Um, like to talk about some very specific monoids and their representations. Now, so I have this funny monoid that I call, I will draw it on the board, it's probably a little bit better. Um, I will call, I will have a set. No, I don't get to set a name. No, it doesn't matter. I have a set from one to n minus one. And I essentially have a multiplication on that set. And I just add join a unit because, well, I want a monoid, but you can ignore the unit, I call it one prime. And the multiplication in this monoid is ridiculous. The multiplication in this monoid is a, b equals a. So you can essentially do everything you want with the monoid. And in the special case, n equals 1, I just have um, two elements, 0 and the stupid unit. And 0 is a 0, and 1 is a 1. So it's a monoid with two elements, the 0 element and the 1 element. At least funny monoids. Well, I just note them by the funny symbol, doesn't matter. Um, so you can actually compute that quiver. So you can make a really, really precise what the representation theory is in some sense. And the quiver is the following it's, it has two simple modules. We'll see them momentarily. And it has n edges here. Okay. So for n equals one, it's just this one. For n equals two, uh, n equals 2 is this one, and so on. In particular, this is a fun example. So it will turn out that both representations are trivial. And for n equals 3, this is a fun example of a monoid, which has only two simple representations, and is wild. So from the quiver, you can see the representation type is wild, which means it has infinitely many, uh, impossible to classify in decomposables, and they are all extensions of trivial representations. A very strange monoid. The first one is semi-simple. The second one already is, is uh, of, of finite representation type. And from there onwards, it gets pretty wild. 
So this monoid, I said again, has infinitely many incomposables, which are just non trivial extensions of those two simple models. Where's the basic alpha? Sorry? Where's the basic alpha? Oh, sorry, I can't hear you. Where's basic algebra? Uh, the basic algebra is just to take the group algebra, and it's the one where you just have one item potent per simple model. So it's unique up to Morita equivalence, kind of the minimal one up to Morita equivalence. All I'm saying is monoid is Morita equivalent to the quiver that you see here, to, to the algebra of the quiver that you see here. That's a kind of a fun example of uh, a monoid. Okay, and this monoid will play some role uh, momentarily. And here you have a, a Cayley graph of a monoid, which is not the same one, so this is the only one I I saw the picture, I could have done a picture myself, and the only nice picture I found. And you can see that it's very different from groups. So there's two generators, F and G. So here is a group of units, there's just one unit, it's, it's a unit. There's just one invertible element, it's a unit. And as soon as you apply any generator, you get, get away from it, and you never can come back. Information loss, right? You could never go back. Um, here's another blob of the same type of information. So you can always go from G to G squared and back. Same for F, but you can't go back to one. And there's a final little block down here. And you can draw the picture as follows. So you have one block here, one block here, one block here. And you have something like a diamond, right? You, you, as soon as you leave one, you end up in one of the uh, two corners. And you can go in between those two corners as much as you want. Information type is the same. But if you go one further down, you again, can't come back, and then you could cycle around in the bottom. And essentially, all monoids have such a presentation, such that you have those little blocks of equal information where you could cycle around, and otherwise, you just uh, move around. So let uh, come back to my little example of the cyclic monoid. It's exactly the same, just it's a bit more boring. So as a unit, you have A, you have A squared, A cubed, and eventually you start cycling around. So information loss goes upwards, right? So if you're here and you jump to here, you can never go back, but inside of this little bubble, you just cycle around. In particular, it only shows you a little bit. So all of these little bubbles look like they correspond to groups. And in fact, the monoid is basically built out of groups of uh, low, uh, equal information. So you have those little blobs that you uh, jump from one to the other, you can't go back, but within a block, it's sort of like a, a group type structure. And let me warn you here again with roll credits back to the uh, to the conference. So we've seen many talks, and many talks used the rigidity of the underlying representation category. So here that would mean perhaps, for example, for a group, uh, group algebra is a Hopf algebra. The monoid algebra is not a Hopf algebra. If you remember what the Hopf structure is for the group, it's something like G goes to, I should probably write S of G goes to G inverse. And yeah, well, what is G inverse for a monoid? Exactly. So a monoid is just a bi algebra. So you can nicely tensor representations, but you don't necessarily have a, a dual representation. And that changes if you just think of the more better picture. Of the categorical picture changes every quite everything quite different makes everything quite different. Um, so one of my favorite tricks in tensor categories, for example, is the projective tensor project to projective from an idea. Projective tensor projective is projective, and that's just wrong. So projective tensor projective here could be non-projective, and you find zillions of examples where that is actually the case. So a lot of you can't take traces, for example. Again, we have seen many traces. Uh, in the previous talks, and it's just all not working for more life. It's kind of kind of fun. So it's a, a lot of the story works, but then there are some subtleties uh, they don't want, don't quite want to go through. So monoid representations have no duals in general. Cool. So let me now tell you about representations of monoids halfway through the talk, and two representations play a key role, and they are really really simple. Um, so I have my monoid F, and I have my group of units G, so invertible elements. That's all I'm saying. So here my little G, and I can define two trivial representations that I call one bottom, one B, and one top, one T, 
I will make precise, uh, I will tell you in a second why I would like to do that. And the top trivial representation just sends everything to one. And the bottom trivial representation sends all group elements to one and all monoid elements, to, uh, so all non group elements to zero, all non invertible elements to zero. So those representations, uh, every monoid will have them. So a monoid has two trivial representations, uh, the bottom representation and the top representation. And they appear as follows in the monoid picture. You can think of uh, the monoid picture as being this equivalence classes of um, information, then it actually forms a lattice. There will be a bottom and a top somewhere, and the bottom one corresponds to the trivial representation, the bottom trivial, and the top trivial corresponds to the top. Because, kind of fun fact about monoid representations, the equivalence classes on the monoid give rise to the same equivalence classes on the representations of the monoid. So the representations are actually ordered as well. So I can talk about a representation sitting somewhere. And one of them sits at the bottom, and one of them sits at the top. I don't need to go further into details. Um, you just should keep in mind that there is an order on the representations of a monoid, and that the order forms a nice a preset or a nice lattice, actually. And the two extreme examples are the trivial representations. And there are two of them. Either I, I uh, just kill all non group elements, or I just send everything. Um, to one. And this was exactly in our little basic algebra picture that I had before. So every monoid has at least those two. Remember, so these are exactly those two representations. And uh, the monoid was a basic algebra like this. It has only those two trivial representations that are really, really trivial. And everything else is a non trivial extension of those representations. And you have infinitely many uh, indecomposables made out of. Those two little guys. Looks very innocent, but actually you can get as fancy as you want. An example is, in case you have noticed, they could be the same and they're exactly the same if my monoid is a group. Yeah. And so this should look familiar in, for groups, you only have one trivial representation. But I'm kind of interested in the non-group monoids, so I always will keep those two little guys around. Okay, so the monoid says only one monoid with one element, and that's a trivial group, and it has exactly this, those simple representations. There are two monoids with two elements. Um, the one we had on the board was zero and and one. And in the presentation, if you think about it a little bit, one of them is a unit. So for the other one, you only have the choice whether it's squares to itself or whether it's squares to one. And these are the two different uh, monoids. The one was the zero one monoid, and the other one should look very familiar. It's Z mod two, and both of them have just a two simple representations, but very different ones. So the top one has uh, the bottom and the top representation, the trivial ones, and the other one has some kind of a side representation, as you all uh, know very well. Right? So those two representations are always around as soon as I have a, a real monoid and not, not a group. And what I really like to do is now do the following. So I have always those two around, but I can always take something boring, like a direct sum of them, and I just call all of them trivial, some, for some M and N, doesn't matter. And I call the representation gap, so there's my gap on the picture, is the smallest dimension of a non-trivial representation. I have some little subscripts going on, so I can fix a field, or I can vary over all fields. Right? So that's exactly my picture here. So I have those and all of their direct sums on the left, and then there should be some gap, and there should be the minimal one on, on the right-hand side. And I would like this gap to be large for uh, various reasons. So that's why I have this funny picture with a hopefully relatively large gap. The definition is pretty straightforward. That's a trivial because we always have them, and there you go, I just call them trivial, and everything else is non-trivial. And um, yeah, I would, look, I would like to look for the smallest one of those. So let's have a look at some examples, I guess. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> Before we have a look at some examples, this really is some kind of complexity measure of the monoid. And for groups, this is really well studied. We'll see some uh, references so that go back to the early days of group representation theory. It is surprisingly not as popular as other notions in group representation theory, but it, it still was studied by Fabinius and Paul. 
in the early days, but in monarch theory, there was not much, uh, essentially nothing. So um, there we go again. Monoids are less popular than groups. Um, and so usually it's not easy to find those. So what I would look for is instead of being an inequality, I'm usually looking for bounds. Like the rep rep is at least whatever, 15 or something like that, or at most 12, because it's usually pretty hard to write that down explicitly and find a bound is much easier. I will give you some explicit examples in a second. Okay. So my my so the way how I remember this, this is not quite true. Right? very explicit in the second, is that this should be in the smallest dimension of a non-trivial representation, but that's kind of ignoring the extensions. You could still have uh, some extension of them somewhere turning up, but this is kind of what I would like to think of it. And so it's like a, the non-trivial, the smallest non-trivial simple representation of a monoid, either such with K over a fixed field or with the funny, uh, what is it, star symbol, this is the star, an S symbol, um, I will just vary over all K, and this makes a huge difference. You will see that in a second. Okay, theory is boring without examples, so let's have a look at some examples, I hope. All right, my first two monoids, actually, it's not really an example, but I will still call it an example because example sounds, sounds better than convention. So my first two monoids are the trivial monoid, so the monoid with one element, and my zero one one monoid, and they have only trivial representations. So here's the quiver. Here's the quiver. They have only those trivial representations. So if you take this minimum series, then they would be of infinite represent, uh, infinite rep rep. And that's kind of silly because they're easy. So I just define them to be zero. It's just some silly definition, right? So let's go back to my definition. My definition says it should be the smallest bin of a non trivial one, but they are semi simple and only trivial ones. So um, yeah, so I need to do something to those two, and I just define them to be zero. Fun fact, every other monoid is different, so these are the only monoids which have uh, only those trivial representations. Very similar for the group, the only group that has only trivial representations of all fields is uh, the trivial group, and here we just have two of them. That's just it. And I would like to think of it as a complexity measure, so it better has to be very small instead of very large, I guess. Okay, but now honest examples. Um, we'll do that very, very slowly. So let's, the, 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 so how we should read this at the top is always over the complex numbers and at the bottom is over varying the field. So let's do it. And that's the, the color code is, well, blue code corresponds to blue, green to green and so on. So let's go start with this one here and here. So the Z2, well, we have one small non-trivial representation of dimension one. There's a sign representation, so the gap is one. And if the gap is already one, it can't go lower anymore, so over an arbitrary field, the gap is still one. Right, over the complex numbers, you can just um, specialize to uh, one, uh, and minus one, the, the one element, and you get exactly this. The symmetric group, well, turns out that the symmetric group is really, really tiny. So it's, it's very hard to find good examples of monoids where this is really large. So metric group has a sign representation. Um, unless n is 1 or something. Uh, uh, let's say n is 2, then the symmetric group has a sign representation, so the gap is again 1. And um, well, then the same over any field. A more fun example, maybe, is the famous monster group. So and, and this is not trivial, of course. The first two, I hope you were able to follow, but this number here is not trivial, but very well known. Um, it appears in Rock of Greece from the 1980s when Greece tried to construct the monster on exactly acting faithfully on the uh, a vector space of that dimension. So, and it turns out that the gap is exactly that number. That's the smallest simple representation of the monster. And you can verify that by opening the atlas, which you nowadays probably will just do online instead of walking in the library and opening the book. But anyway, uh, so this funny number in this case is a representation gap of the, the monster. And at the bottom of any field, so I want a bit lazy. I only have a lower equal here. So there is a simple representation, which is one dimension lower. And it appears in dimension uh, in characteristic two or three. So there are actually two of them, if you want. 
And the order of the monster is some large power of two, some large power of three, and some other random primes. In particular, uh, it's not semi-simple. And this is a dimension of the smallest simple representation, but I haven't double-checked for extensions, whether they are extensions of the trivial representation. I don't think they are, but I haven't double-checked. That's why I put a, a lower equal here. It's probably an equal. Right? So that's kind of the flavor here. I usually look for the smallest simple representation, but then I need to double-check for um, the, uh, the, the extensions, and I just was too lazy and didn't do it. I'm not claiming it's not known. It's probably well known, but I, I just don't know it. And to illustrate, so maybe my last one, what do we have here as a color, maybe orange, that this really depends on the field, is an old result of Frobenius said that it looks like SL2, that's my SL2, SL2 at P has some large representation gap over the complex numbers. And indeed it does, you need quite a big space to make a, to, to create a complex representation, which is non-trivial. Um, so it's bigger than P minus one over two, which is quite big compared to the group itself. But it completely collapses over a field, uh, over the defining field, because you can just act on the defining uh, representation. Hope that makes some sense. Right? So um, the, the gap depends heavily on the field. And actually, what I really should study is the, the, the star gap when I vary over all fields. And it's really hard to find examples of groups where this gap is large. Usually, it's essentially tiny. Uh, non-existing. And in case you wonder, this number looks big, but it's really, really small compared to the order of the monster itself. So again, it's, it's reasonably, well, complexity, the monster is certainly more complicated than SL2FP, I guess. Um, but you can still present it very efficiently in some sense on, well, in this case, characteristic two or three. Okay, so what about our little monoid here? So the, this one here, remember, I have my little monoid, so not this one or this one, but the one with the arrows. Plop, plop, plop. As soon as you have enough arrows, namely more than zero, and you will find a non-trivial extension only in dimension two, uh, and so the representation gap is two, and that this monoid is essentially independent of the characteristic, so it actually works over any characteristic. Again, there is no simple representation associated to it. There's just the non-trivial ex uh, non extension of my little uh, trivial representations. I will discuss those in a second, so let's just ignore them. So these are all monoids coming from what you all like, from the normal categories, from the new categories, and all that. Turns out that they have a huge representation gap, which is uh, a lot of fun. So they're really, really hard to find, but they do. Let me just mention one more notion. Um, there's an alternative definition what you can use as a complexity measure, which is the tastefulness, right? So uh, representation gap is still here. So it was essentially the smallest non-trivial simple representation, and the tastefulness is the smallest non-trivial faceful representation. Oh. So it's the smallest dimension of a faceful representation. And again, in group theory, kind of we'll see a lot of people have studied that from the from the early days on. So I already had Frobenius. Um, so I think Burnside will be next. But in modern theory, it is relatively new. So here's Steinbeck again, the one from the book, and also Walter Mothershook, uh, who told me about this uh, like, like ages ago. It wasn't in 2011, but it was certainly in the ages ago. That is an alternative measure of complexity of a monoid. Instead of looking for the simple, I look for the faceful representations. And depending on what you have in mind, one of them might be preferable over the other, but the study of them is kind of the same in flavor. So let me do some examples for you. Um, symmetrical versus transformation monoid. Oh, and I have Burnside, as I promised. Uh, so the smallest space for representation for a symmetric group, the little symmetric group is here. Uh, so, and here, again, same notation by the way over the complex numbers or, the, or over any field. Again, makes some small difference. Um, and as soon as the symmetric group is not too small, kind of the who claims formula will tell you um, that the dimension of the standard representation is n minus one, and that's also the smallest faceful representation, which is not completely trivial, but um, was shown by Bernstein quite a while ago. Uh, with contrast, if you go to characteristic, that uh, some characteristic that divides the order of the group, you can actually do one better. There will be a fixed representation in the standard representation that you can get rid of, and still have a, 
a facial representation. And the point is the equality here. So it's not quite trivial to see that there are no smaller facial representation of um, the symmetrical. But as you can see in 1908, it's not like I'm uh, reinventing the wheel here, I guess. Uh, for this one, uh, surprisingly, I didn't find anything. I could have probably done it myself, but I was too lazy. So I might have to put Steinberg in the paper to do it, and it's one bigger uh, than the faithfulness of symmetric group for the transformation monoid. And I haven't checked over general fields. It probably goes one smaller, so probably it's n minus one, but I haven't checked. Note that this number is bigger than the one we have seen before. So before it was one, because there was a sign representation. And now it's at least n minus n minus one is still very tiny compared to the vastness of n factorial, but um, <laughs> it's it's better than one, I guess. Uh, and note here that this is always true. So under some non-trivial assumptions, the the simple the gap is smaller than the faithfulness, and it's always smaller than the order of the group itself, because of course you can faithfully act on on your group. And here's an example that is not quite finite, but Still, people like to study that. So, for example, it makes sense to ask the same question for any group, essentially. And for break groups, it's a very famous question to find faithful representations of break groups. And it turns out that the gap, so that's a Brow representation, if you know what that is, is n minus 1. And the faithfulness is a little bit bigger, but it's still pretty small. Uh, again, it's not easy to, even some infinite group like the break group, it can be very efficiently represented here. Break group and n strands has a faithful representation of dimension n times n minus 1 over 2. And I should be very precise here that nobody proved equality. There is just one. So you just found one. So you know it's at least n minus n over 2. And the representation is a celebrated large file karma Bigelow representation, um, which is really amazing. Like, like any computer algebra system nowadays knows that representation. So if you feed in two braids and ask whether they are the same, it will confidently tell you yes or no. Because it just runs the faithful representation, so it just compares to matrices, which is which is really amazing um, in the theory of, of break groups. But again, note that one of them is always smaller than the other. Hope I make some sense. Again, we haven't seen anything of a really rich large representation yet. They're all really tiny somehow, even for something like the break group. Um, really strange. So what I learned, kind of what I like to sell is that uh, in tensor categories, tensor categories are actually good examples to generate monoids with large representation gap. And essentially what I would like to do is I would like to do some show by duality and it should relate to objects like a little mirror. And I would like to study the uh, monoid associated to whatever V is, it can be more precise in a second, and has this final of monoids, and I would like to write down some representation gap depending on n, right? So I can vary n to be very large, for example. And show value duality kind of suggests whatever show value duality here means, that this should be really large. And why is that? Well, it, it, the dimension of the symbols under show value duality should be something like the number of indecomposables in the tensor product. And as we have seen, for example, in uh, Eckenwolf's talk, they tend to go really, really ridiculously fast for a lot of um, categories. So if you think about SO2 and you tend to SO2 representations, we'll do that explicitly in a second. They're just zillions of factors. And I can actually do that uh, explicitly for you instead of doing it. So an SO2 representation, uh, let's do well, work over the complex numbers. So SO2, C, and I work over the complex numbers. They always have this form, right? So simple ones. I just did lines, and then they have those weight vectors, and the difference between the weight vectors is always two. Very good. So if I take the representation, the obvious one, and I could think of it as having weight, and we'll do the following trick. I call it Q plus Q inverse. Yeah, it has it is this one. It has weight Q, Q inverse if you want. So uh, one and minus one. So if I take the nth tensor power, I need to get rid of this picture here, take the nth tensor power, that's just the character of the representation. And how can I count integral posables? Well, because all of my 
so simples in this case, so from all of my simples are just lines. So there will be a bunch of them and they will pile up like a binomial coefficient. But in particular, in the middle, I can just check whether they are, they, they, they touch the middle. So the only thing I need to check is so the number of summons of C squared to the N is just the appearance of, depending on parity, uh, the, the, the uh, factor in front of q to the zero or q to the one in this expression, right? Because they all need to go through the little line. And this is very easy to count. So let me just do the even case. Then this is just n choose n over two by binomial theory. And this little beast here, right? I just count the number of appearances of q to the zero because of this little picture here. And this little beast here grows by Sterling's formula, like two to the n over square root of n, which is really, really fast. So essentially the growth of the sum of the tensor product, so the growth of this, this dimension is of course two to the n, is essentially the same as uh, the growth of the underlying dimension representation. Now I'm kind of using this here on the Chauvin duality, and the same is true for, for all of those. Categories. Calculation is a bit tricky, obviously. When SF2, you're just very lucky and you just sit the middle binomial coefficient. And this is kind of what started this project. So, if you really want to find monoids with not simple representations, well, something like a tensor product construction should actually do the job here. And it's not quite trivial, but let me just mention this. If you vary the field, like you do this over SP or something, the growth rate will not drop drastically. It will go a little bit down, uh, but it won't drop drastically. So it's still around the same type of order. We'll see that actually explicitly in a second. So I will show you just the easiest one. SO2, right? I, I wrote two years on SO2. Who doesn't like SO2, I guess? And this is what I figured out about SO2. I'm very impressive. Um, so let me just explain the underlying monoid is called the temporal leap monoid. And it was really, really simple. And it's, well, we'll see it again what it is in a second. But it's really, really simple. It's one of these little gadgets that you hopefully have seen at one point in your life. So you just have a certain number of points on the bottom, that's n, a certain number of points on the top, that's again n. And you're allowed to connect them in a pairing type way such that um, there are no crossings. Something like that. So each little picture here is an element, uh, and like in any reasonable diagram calculus, I'll show you a picture in a second. Uh, multiplication is just stacking them on top of one another, and you could think of these as just being diagrammatic representations of intertwiners in this framework so of, of morphisms in this framework of tensor products of representations. And in monoid theory, there are very a lot of people have rediscovered this monoid actually. So, in monoid theory or the algebra, whatever category, uh, in monoid theory, they are studied under the notion of partition algebras. Um, so, you see a partition at the top. I only explain this one. And the partition tells you what you need to connect. So, here are the positive numbers. Here are the negative numbers. So here are the positive negative numbers. And I connect one and minus three, one and minus three, two and minus four, two and minus four, three and four, and minus one and minus two. I hope I haven't messed up. Same for the bottom. And that's how you can feed them in a machine. So again, you could feed everything in a machine, and the machine will take the left-hand side and will like it, and you can just compose it and tell you uh, quite a bit about this monoid. And that's SO2. We'll see that in a second again. Multiplication in all of these monoids is always the same. You take one diagram in my notation, you stack it on the top of the other. Um, so the circle, if you see a circle, it evaluates to one because you want to have a monoid. But there's an algebra version where you can evaluate the circle to, to any, any field you want. But here it's just one because I have my little monoid. And this is how it comes from. This is where it comes from. It really comes from the picture I already erased, very sad. So you should expect the following to happen for this monoid. It, it's not quite as simple because it's not over C, it's a bit more complicated. But essentially, there should be a binomial type of picture for this monoid because it arises. Um, for the quantum group. If you forgive me that I put a quantum group here. So it arises for a, as a dual for the quantum group if you specialize to a third rotability. 
So that's how the monoid actually comes up. Uh, so it's not quite as trivial the calculation um, than what we have seen here for over the complex numbers is a bit more complicated. So I've done SO2 in a bit more complicated fashion here, but it's still essentially SO2 or GO2 actually, whatever you like. So I wrote GL2, I should have written the asset. My apologies. And this is a very famous. Um, so uh, yesterday we heard about a very efficiently written papers, um, like Ruman's papers. Ruman's papers are fantastic. They're just super efficient. Here another bunch of very efficiently written papers. So they do um, all of the separate leap stuff, all the representation theory of asset two, and some uh, bending of chemical elements and put them all together and just do it in two papers with a total length of nine pages. And um, also discover the Kaufmann bracket, if you know what a Kaufmann bracket is. And all in the 30s of the last century. Uh, very impressive. So the table elite calculus goes back quite a while. And it's, the best of my knowledge, the first diagram calculus. And if you kind of ignore like putting great pictures together. So putting great pictures together is even older, which should go back to someone like, like Gauss. And this is the second oldest and very efficient again. Not as efficient as Riemann, I guess, but, but still very impressive. So uh, very readable if you ever want to read um, Ruma Teller Weil's paper. So Weil is probably very well known. Edward Teller is also sometimes called the mastermind of the Cold War because um, was one of the uh, was one of the people who pushed the idea of stocking up nuclear weapons. Um, and there's kind of a long uh, Wikipedia article on Edward Teller, and I, I still wonder whether the this calculus was actually used in the construction of nuclear bombs. But I can't tell you because all the documents are classified, so I'm not 100% sure. But that was just a side story where this monarch comes from. So again, I'm not doing really anything new. It's actually the only thing I do goes back to those guys here. Uh, and one of my heroes, again, Hermann Weil. So we already had forbidden and Burnside, I guess. And this is how the picture looks like. And well, it was done, I will explain the picture in a second, by probably one of the most efficient uh, mathematicians ever called a computer. And this is the dimension of the simple representations in the following reading way. Um, it looks like a binomial. So it's a, every combinatorial number should look like a binomial. It looks like a binomial. Very good. There's a little bump pointing inwards. I don't know where that comes from, but it appears. Otherwise, it looks like a binomial. So the simple representations of TL, N, are indexed by the numbers n, n minus 2, n minus 4, up to 0 or 1, depending on parity. And I just put them on the line, counting in this direction. So here is the bottom trivial representation, which is, of course, of dimension 1. Here's the top trivial representation, which is of dimension 1. And I plot um, the dimensions of the representations of TL24 on, on the screen. So they are very small at the bottom. And then they just spike up at the top, which fits to the following picture that we had before, just a non-semi-simple version of this picture here. So essentially what happens, I calculated that the gross rate here was 2 to the n over square root of n. But essentially what happens is that some representations just appear ridiculously often, and some don't appear at all. And that's exactly what happens here. So some symbols are just ridiculously huge, and some don't appear at all, or essentially not in any reasonable way. So um, then I've done this calculation, not just for 24 strands, you know, 24 strands is a bit boring, but for uh, something like a thousand strands, and you will see the pattern and you, you know exactly what to do, and then you can just um, get a, a bound for the minimal representations, and you can just write it down, and it works as follows. So as you can see, some trick that I would like to do with monoids, I'm essentially done, don't worry, not going over time, is that they have their simple representations arranged in some kind of lattice type picture. And actually this forms an ideal in the monoid. So what you can always do is you can always kind of take a quotient and add a unit again. So you can make the monoid smaller. And since a simple representation of the monoid arranged in the same way, we can get rid of unwanted simple representations. And it's a trick you can play in a monoid, not in a group. So you can truncate your monoid and can get rid of small representations. And here's some obvious uh, 
obvious uh, number where you could truncate. So you can truncate the monoid, get rid of the small ones, and only have big ones remaining. So what then essentially the computer did, uh, not me, was to write down a formula. Um, and this is what comes out. So uh, there's a formula in N and K, N is the number of strands, K is the truncation. I just have chosen a nice one so that it fits on the formula. And it turns out that it's again a binomial. What a surprise. It's not quite the nice binomial as before. It's sort of light, slightly distorted. And you will see that this is a growth rate. So the, the, the simpler representations grow um, with the, the smallest one grows of this order, two to the n times n over minus five over two. Um, and the smallest space for representation is a bit bigger. It's uh, actually one bigger if you want. It's two to the n, uh, n minus three over two. And we can do that together if you want. And then I'm already done. So let's do the bottom one together. So if the computer tells you that this is the formula, the rest is actually simple. Well, the computer can also tell you the approximation, of course. So you have n, um, and you can ignore the minus one, obviously, because you're just interested in some asymptotic formula. You have six over n, you can ignore the plus four, you can ignore the six. This is just a one over n. I see an n here. Uh, this is two to the n over n square root of n. So I take that together and I get two to the n, n of minus three over two as a gross rate. And same here, just n and n, right? Hey, that's good news. This, this is an example, and all of the others work in the same way. Um, with a monad, this is really large uh, faithfulness and representation. So faithfulness, again, is a bit bigger, as you can see. It's not quite the gross rate of 2 to the n, but in a log plot, you can uh, you essentially don't distinguish them anymore. So <laughs> kind of fun. So you have as many summons in a tensor product as you have, uh, well, as the dimension of the tensor product. It's kind of... In other words, the dimension of the illegal postman of a tensor product compared to the vastness of dimension of the tensor product to the n, which is the dimension of uh, the space, so 2 to the n in this case, it, it's just one. It's just negligibly small. Anyway, so I did the same for all of the others, um, but I'm out of time. And they all have really large representation gaps. I should mention this one here because I think it, should, it will appear in one of the next talks. So the bar algebra uh, has even larger representations. Okay, and thank you very much.